Ladies, gentlemen, thank you for taking your seats. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for taking your seats. Our next session is session three on health research, innovation, and data for sustainable development. I will pass the floor to Mr. Henry Bonsu, who is a journalist and broadcaster from the UK and Ghana. Henry. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Greetings, everybody. Akwaba, Karibu, Woza. Come on, people. This is an African gathering. We want some energy. We want some life. Remember, we're human beings. We want to engage. I'm really surprised that this many people have come into this auditorium at what I'm afraid is, panel, the graveyard shift. This is where we need some emergency medical intervention to keep people awake, or if they have expired, to bring them back from the dead, like Lazarus. So, how many of you here, here's a question for you, raise your right hand, how many people here feel research is sexy, who feel really turned on by research? My, you bunch of liars, I don't believe any of you. Give yourselves a round of applause, come on. Well done for being here, well done for being here. Fantastic, I am delighted to be back in Kigali, I was here some three years ago or so at the African Development Bank meeting. I'm Henry Bonsu. In Ghana, they call me Henry Nana Kwame Ose Bonsu. The Francophones say, Monsieur Bonsu, but the Ghanaians say, Bonsu. It means whale. It means I'm descended from some mighty marine creature, which is fantastic. It's great to be back here in Kigali among all of you for this first um, WHO Forum on African Health. Really, really important for me both personally and professionally. Professionally, as a journalist, health stories are always at the top of the agenda for me. But when you think about it, personally, personally, like many of you, I have members of my family, both in the UK and Ghana, and there's always somebody suffering from one of the communicable or non-communicable diseases that people associate with Africans, like prostate cancer, you know, diabetes, there are so many issues, high blood pressure. In fact, when I told my dad I was coming down to Rwanda for this forum, he says, good, yes, let them sort out the health care so that we Africans can go home. And I said, dad, they're not thinking about you in the diaspora, they're thinking about Africans back home. You have health care that's free at the point of delivery, so-called universal health care. But we're talking about the Africans who are in Africa and who have to deal with the reality of life. Am I right? Do you believe me? It's true. What my dad said is true. So he remains in the northwest of England waiting for you to solve it so he can go back home to Accra, okay? So how do we get the healthy Africa we all want? Well, there's the financing, as we heard in session one. There's security, as we heard in session two. But there's an elephant in the room, a great big African elephant with huge ears and massive tusks that was partly unveiled in the previous session. And that is, of course, research, which is what we're going to talk about in this third and final session today. Our panel has a great task because you guys have been listening to so much over the past few hours. The task really is to engage among themselves, but also to engage you. We've got to think about health, research, innovation, and data for sustainable development. We've got to look at the kinds of research there is at the moment, the tools that we have at our disposal, what our governments are doing about it and not doing about it. Is there a connection or a disconnect between the researchers, the policy makers, and crucially, the implementers? People always forget about the implementers, but they're the ones on the ground doing some of the work. Now, in a moment, I'll introduce our panel and our keynote speaker. But first, a little bit more background, and it's pretty grim. Some figures. According to the landmark WHO survey of a couple of years ago, and here's some figures, looking at the national health systems of 47 African countries, 
51%, 51% had no national health research policy. 45% had no health research council or institute. And 53%, more than half, had no budget to support research in their ministries of health. I could go on, but I don't want to depress you because I want to leave you with hope by the end of the next 80 or so minutes. We've got a very, very experienced panel who work on the front line of research in Africa, Europe, and the US. Now, on my extreme left, though not politically, I don't think, having talked to him today, <laughs> are, first of all, Professor Pontiano Kalebu, Director of the Uganda Virus Institute in Entebbe. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Mary, uh, Mary is in the middle. I had you in my mind over there, but I'm going to introduce you next. Dr. Mary Amoyunzu Niamongo, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the African Institute for Health and Development. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> and Dr. Joseph Babigumwira, who leads the Department of Public Health and Epidemiology, University of Washington Global Medicines Program. Please. <laughs> With enthusiasm. They're going to respond to the observations of our keynote speaker. They'll make their further comments and then respond to your questions and statements. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Michael Makanga, Executive Director, European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership in The Hague, in the Netherlands. And his organization is a public, public partnership between sub-Saharan African countries, European countries, and the European Union. Dr. Makanga, don't blind us with science. Enthuse us, make us feel hot, energized, and ready to do battle with you, or to engage with you. Please, give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, Moderator, and uh, I want to first of all um, say, um, honourable ministers, um, the director of WHO, African region, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's really an opportune moment to talk about research and innovation, an area that has been long forgotten. And I want to start by saying, research and innovation are the key drivers for any national economy. And if we are going to put first things first and putting people first, health research and innovation has to come first. And I want to encourage our health ministers here present, our finance ministers here present, to have this re-echoed every year so that we have a boost in research and innovation in the African region. What do we know about local knowledge for decision making? In order to strategize, plan, implement, and monitor efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals, it is necessary to collect information on current conditions. These data are derived from multiple sources, including research, civil registration, vital statistics systems, demographic surveillance systems, and health facility data collection and monitoring. Country investment in these systems and infrastructure is needed. And this is very critical. It should be borne in mind that, in, that such infrastructure need not to be over a complex. African countries are well placed to exploit mobile, tel mobile telecommunications for data collection. We've just had an e-health session just before. And the utility of simple approaches, such as verbal, pot verbal autopsy and minimal invasive autopsies, have been demonstrated. When one considers the data and information derived from research efforts, it is clear that open data and open access publishing efforts are particularly important, especially in the, content, in the context of Africa. 
Many African researchers, many policymakers and implementers don't have access to the information that they need. It needs to be readily available and accessible. And I must say that the African region publication productivity has increased by 10.3% annually between 2000 and 2014. And the trends continue to improve. We need to make it better. And although it is evident that North-South collaboration is highly advantageous in terms of publication metrics and citation impact, this is important. But more so, South-South collaboration needs to be explored and investment in this needs to be increased. It is unfortunate that brain drain is a serious impediment to retaining knowledge and skills in Africa, which must be addressed at the country level and incorporated in grant agreements and research fund and also considered by research funders. One may say that you are talking about brain drain, where are you? I'm part of brain circulation. Country ownership and data acquisition, retention, and knowledge enables the identification of priority areas for research and appropriate direction of the available funding. To overemphasize, not to overemphasize this, it is important, and I repeat it, country ownership, country ownership has to be given attention. What to fund in terms of research and funding priorities? Efficient allocation of research funding depends on the identification and knowledge gaps in the public health, uh, their mechanisms as broad-based stakeholder consultation, uh, data collection and monitoring efforts mentioned earlier. Priority should be given to an African-driven research agenda set by local project coordinators and with recognition of the ethical issues beyond the approval of study protocols. Researchers should give due consideration to the structural power dynamics of north-south relationships and articulate situated ethics guidelines related to such partnerships as part of funding agreements. We all need to, re uh, to respect the domestic or the local settings uh, to get approvals and registrations and to ensure that there is harmonization with the local research priorities and interests. Research priorities should and must be met via an integrated national health, uh, national health research system. The complex work of constructing these systems involve the initiation, funding, and long support of many interlinked components. For example, the National Health Research Ethics Committees, which ensure equitable and ethical conduct of in-country um, of in, of, of in research in alignment uh, with local conditions and priorities. And we have to recognize that some countries do lack this and their efforts that are available and these have to be tied up with local ownership. Health laboratory systems, which support inter-country sample analysis and development of capacity, while preventing extractive and potentially extra, uh, exploitive activities. These have to be given attention. National regulatory agencies, which are concerned with approval and regulation of medicines and medical uh, products, as well as pharmacovigilance, I'm glad that the uh, NEPAD agency is doing a lot in this area, together with WHO Afro and with other partners like EDCTP. National research councils, which oversee domestic health research, set the agenda and work to translate research findings into policy. It is a bit upsetting that only 45% of the countries have national research councils or organizations that oversee research. And this is where our ministers of health and our ministers of science and technology need to take this up. And legislative frameworks, the AU model law 
on, med uh, on medical product regulations uh, is an example to this. How to fund research in terms of sustainable funding? Historically, less than 10% 10, 10 of the worldwide health research resources have been applied to low and middle income countries that experience 90% of the global burden of health, uh, of poor health. Unfortunately, the global research agenda remains inequitable. And uh, we must continuously seek to redress this imbalance through innovative and sustainable funding models. I just want to highlight a few. For example, we have the advanced uh, market commitment as is used by, uh, on, uh, by Gavi for the pneumococcal vaccine. We have product development partnerships, the non-profit entities operating with uh, philanthropic uh, funds, which form collaborative partnerships with the public sector and other partners involved in product development. We have the Social Impact Investment Fund, uh, which provides for finance to organizations addressing social needs with explicit expectation of a measurable social uh, as well as financial return. And we also have public-public partnerships. We've just mentioned the EDSTP program, which is a partnership between African countries and European countries. Currently, we have 14 on one side and 14 on the other side with co-funding from the European Union. And this is open towards promoting research and innovation uh, in the continent. We should be particularly concerned with ensuring equity of sustainable funding initiatives through African input and leadership, South-South networking, and the alignment and harmonization of donor activities with country priorities. In this regard, the output of the multi-funder essence on health research in, uh, initiative is quite informative, and this is hosted by WHO uh, at the headquarters. It is not only the responsibility of external donors and funders to provide research, uh, provide for research in the African continent. It is the responsibility of all of us and the countries to take ownership. And this is where I re-echo the message, invest in health. This is the only way to make progress. What do we do with what we know from research to policy and from policy to implementation? Progress towards attainment of sustainable development goals requires high-level uptake of the products of health. High-profile advo advocates are needed to promote science with, uh, with African society and to ensure research gets its share of the national budget budgetary allocation and attracts additional external funding. There is no better audience to talk about funding for research and innovation than this audience that brings together the ministries of health and the ministries uh, of science and technology, rather, and the other ministries that work with the Minister of Health. I will just go now to my take-home uh, take message, and that is, one, country investment in the systems and infrastructure required to collect data on the current conditions is critical. Country ownership on data acquisition Retention and knowledge unlocks the identification of priority areas for research and appropriate direction of the available funding. Open data and open access publishing, uh, open up access uh, publishing efforts are particularly important in the African context. North-South collaborations are important, but we need to explore and exploit more and invest more in South-South collaboration. This is key in order to ensure that we have research and innovation that will address our local needs. Of course, we have the challenge of brain drain and we have to get around it. And this has to begin with the countries taking on this battle to make sure that there is proper career paths and also that the researchers that are involved are well motivated and also encouraged to stay. There is need to ensure equity of sustainable funding initiatives through increased African input, leadership, South South networking, and the alignment and harmonization of donor activities with country priorities. And lastly, and not the least, 
progress towards attainment of the sustainable development goals requires high level uptake of the products of health research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. For that, Dr. Michael Makanga, please uh, resume your seat. So, several, I think I counted seven take home messages. I'm going to chew on some of those initially among ourselves, of course. And if you have a burning question early on, just raise your hand, and if I don't see you straight away, raise it wildly and I may catch you, or some of our colleagues with the microphones may catch you, and we'll let you come in early. But initially, we want to try and focus on some of those take-home messages emanating from Michael's presentation. I'm going to go uh, to you, uh, Mary, um, Director and Technical Advisor, African Institute for Health and Development. Which of those take-home messages would you say you're going to take home with you to Nairobi? And which are you going to leave here in Kigali? Because um, there were several of them, and I, they're all important, but one or two for you as a lead researcher must be particularly pertinent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your presentation. My discussion would be around who sets the research agenda at the country level. Yep. The issue about country ownership. Do we have platforms that bring together researchers, policymakers, and implementers to sit and agree on the research agenda? Or do we as researchers sit alone, decide on our priorities in research, and hope that policymakers will take them and use them? Secondly, a question to the policymakers in this room Do we really use evidence when you are making policies? And if we use evidence, where do we get that evidence from? And so we could be talking about policy, evidence, and, policy, and uh, researchers, but we have not tried to bring those boxes together. We have not tried, endeavored, to ensure that we set the research agenda together. As we do research, do we have a policy lens. As a university in Kenya, if I'm funded to do research, do I ask myself, what's the policy relevance of the research I'm doing? And so there are pertinent questions as we think about using evidence to influence policy, is who sets the agenda? Mm -hmm. Whose questions are we responding to? Whose needs are we addressing? And as a social scientist, I would like to bring down the research to the household community level. What issues are we addressing with the research we are doing? In the morning, uh, Dr. Moeti talked about leaving no one behind. Do we know who is being left behind? Mm -hmm. Why they are being left behind? What strategies can be used to lift them to a level where we feel they should be? What kind of research is needed for the African issues we are addressing? Whose priorities are we pushing? And therefore, as people sitting in this room, and as we begin to ask ourselves questions on research, policy, and programming, we need to be asking ourselves, whose questions are we addressing? Mary, you've asked a lot of questions there. I'm going to ask you to answer one of them. Who sets your research agenda in Nairobi at the African Institute for Health and Development? Who sets your agenda? Okay, unfortunately, and this may come back to all of us, if my research is funded externally, I may be responding to external needs. I may be answering a local question, but my audience for research is not the local audience. That is the tragedy of what we are talking about. Thank you. The tragedy of what we're talking about. Very honest answer. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to move along and ask uh, Joseph, you're out there in Washington State, but cast your eye on some of these take-home messages. Now, I'm just wondering which one you feel speaks to you. Which one will you take with you on that long flight to Seattle? And which one will be left here at I the Mio I, I, I would say none. None? Yeah, because uh, I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a contrarian in this sense. Uh, because you know, there's things that, that we can do and there's things that we can't do. And you know, all of Michael's points are, are well taken. Uh, but Quite honestly, uh, the resource gaps exist, and uh, you know I, I use economics as, as sort of my basis. Information is a public good, so uh, if research is being done at the global level, we don't need to repeat that research. 
uh, we need to focus our efforts in Africa to perform research at that very local context. And that's why I agree with Mary that we don't need to repeat clinical trials for new drugs. We don't need to engage in global policy. The WHO and the World Bank do that. Uh, we need to do research at local clinics, private and public, you know, local public health offices, uh, so that uh, we can innovate at that very local level, even for things like personnel. We don't need a bunch of PhDs in economics and epidemiology, but we need uh, regular health workers doing research on a day-to-day -day basis, doing small studies, doing uh, observational studies, clinical studies, and then uh, setting policy at that local level. Because the global level, uh, in terms of policy, WHO, in terms of research, a lot of academic centers, all the big universities really fill that gap. So it's not so much to disagree with Michael, uh, but to sort of put it the other way around. Those gaps do exist. If there was enough money uh, for research, then I would say that economics doesn't work, because there's always going to be a resource gap. But for every $100 we spend on research, and for the little research money that comes from our ministers of health, I think that money has a bigger multiplier effect if it's channeled to uh, performing research at the very basic level, at clinics and you know, regional and district public health offices. But local is good, and you could use the take-home message number two, country ownership or local ownership at the very, very grassroots level. So I think you're taking uh, number two back home with you to Seattle, okay, I'll, I'll even agree with you though you that. don't want to accept it. But, I mean, who's going to set, just to take Mary's point, set the agenda for those local clinicians, the people implementing on the ground in the rural places who are often neglected, who's setting their agenda? What kind of research are they doing? To what end? So, really, the agenda is well aligned uh, between uh, poor and rich countries with regard to at least health outcomes. So, for example, if someone develops a new drug for malaria or for lung cancer, that drug will work for an American as it will work for an African uh, in a village in Gabon. However, in some other aspects of research, uh, knowledge doesn't travel very well. As a health economist, for example, uh, you know, data on cost, for example, doesn't travel well because the salary of a physician in America is different from the salary of a physician uh, in Comoros or in Namibia. So we need to focus on those things that don't travel well and then piggyback off rich countries on those things that travel well. And that's why I'm saying, I'm saying that because the research agenda for most, uh, most research is set by the people who produce the resources and who give the resources. However, there's still a way we can align our, 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 our research questions and our research agenda to their agenda mm -hmm. insofar as it benefits us. And then use Without losing modest, the funding. Exactly. And then use our modest resources for those things that don't align well with uh, their agendas. Thank you very much for that, Joseph. Pontiano, I'm coming to you now. In Uganda, the director of the Uganda Virus Research Institute, I'm just looking at some of these messages that emanated from Michael's presentation. Are you going to abandon them all, or will you take one or two with you to Kampala? <clears throat> and which ones? Uh, thank you very much. And like my colleagues who has abandoned all of them, I'm taking all of them. Ah, good. <laughs> uh, you must be given applause for that. Please. I think, I think Michael has listed all the components. I think some, some of the components. That should be in our research uh, prior, uh, strategic plans. When you mention the figures, how many countries have research plans, have priorities, and all, it is depressing. But I think what he has mentioned is some of those very components and where we should start. And he mentioned about data, local data. Very, very important because we need that local data to set our research priorities. I'll give you an example. There was one district in Uganda, in eastern Uganda, where over a period of time, they thought the, cause, the biggest cause of death in adolescents and young men was malaria. They didn't have any data for a long time. They concentrated on malaria. Okay, okay, they did something. But when they did very good local data collection, they found it was road traffic accidents in an area. But in the following area, it was something completely different. Mm -hmm. Local data is so important. But what Mike, I think, has listed is what is key in our uh, strategic plan for our research and setting our research priorities. I agree with, I agree with John and other colleagues that, yes, this sets the agenda. Local, local. Information that is local, 
that's relevant locally, and that will drive to what we are talking about, putting people first and the road to uh, universal health for all. I think I want to go further. That as we move from here, you mentioned the key components, the researchers, the policymakers, the implementers. We need to ask ourselves, what is failing? Because we have come together, we have talked, we have written documents, declarations, the allegiance declaration, but they are not moving forward. I think the key question now is why are we failing to move forward? Advocacy is key in order to move forward with all the lists that Mike has mentioned. I'll, I'll talk later, but I'll give you examples where I've used advocacy, and it has worked with our yep. politicians. It has worked with our finance uh, ministries. We need to advocate, work together. But I do agree that these are important components. A starting point is to have a plan. Countries should have plans and priorities. Thank you very much for that, Pontiana. Uh, Michael, I'm just wondering what your response is to how your presentation was received. Yeah, thank you very much. One thing I want to say is that as Africans, I want us to think big and to look at the whole value chain of product development. Part of what I've heard is that we should restrict, restrict ourselves to just one element of implementation research and leave the big things elsewhere. No, we need to be involved at all levels of product development. And this is where the point here is partnership. Work with others to make sure that we do it here. Just to give you an example, if I may use an example of malaria research, the um, atemesinin-based combination therapies that are available out there and have been adopted by the different malaria control programs, this is data that has been generated here in Africa through large studies that have been funded, and this is data that is relevant to our context. When we talk about HIV, most of the work that has been done on antiretroviral therapy, work that has been done on the different resistance patterns, it is data that is generated here through large studies that are relevant to our context. If we are going to sit and wait and just apply one little bit at the end, I think we are getting it wrong. The other thing is that when we partner, what we generate here is of global relevance and is taken even to and applied to other settings. I'll give you an example. We've recently funded work that is involving um, well, in the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, work that has influenced change in policy. These are global policy changes generated in Africa, but of global relevance. Work on TB resistance. It is generated here and also in other regions, but the bulk of it is generated here in Africa and is utilized in other regions. Are you saying that Africa so is not getting the credit? Big and to look at the whole value chain of product development. Are you saying that Africa is not getting the credit for some of that critical work which has application globally? We need to take more credit and we need to take more ownership or co-ownership. Excellent. Well, I'll hear, amen to that. Thank you very much for that. Very, very good point. I, I'm just wondering about some of the other issues that have been raised so far, not least brain drain. How critical an issue is brain drain? The talent that's harvested, that's cultivated here in this continent and that ends up in other parts of the world for a very long time, sometimes never to come back, um, Joseph, from Seattle. I'm, I'm, I'm only playing with him, but <laughs> go on, Joseph. I'm both, I'm both a cause and a consequence of brain drain. So yes. uh, I sort of, that's a, a, an issue that's close to my heart. But if I were to ask the ministers of health here if they were able to absorb all the capacity that their countries produce? Uh, the answer would probably be no. And I think that uh, one thing that I agree with, uh, with Michael on is that uh, it's essentially a globe now and talent is distributed globally. So restricting talent by saying it's brain drain and trying to quote unquote force people to work in uh, their jurisdictions of origin is a negative in economic terms. So in some ways it's brain gain. But that said, I think that uh, without increasing capacity at the local level, uh, 
especially with resources, then brain drain continues. It's inevitable. However, uh, that's why I was talking about the multiplier. If resources are spent at the local level, then it's a stimulant on the supply side of talent, and that is uh, essentially uh, to mitigate uh, brain drain in the long run. That would be uh, essential, essentially. But like I said, I'm, a, I'm both a cause and a consequence. I don't, no, I don't I, know. You explained it very well, uh, Joseph. Before I pivot to any uh, African health minister, I know there are one or two sitting in the front, twitching nervously, uh, to ask them to respond to your question. I'm just wondering if any of our fellow panelists um, feel that restrictions should be, I don't want to use the word impose, but I'll use the word impose on those who um, receive grants for research in their African country, which has trained them to persuade them to stay and spend at least the earlier part of their career in their home country before going abroad to Canada or the UK or the US. You're, you're, you're nodding your head, Mary. Um, my, my take is we are, most of us are here and we work in Africa. Yeah. And some of us were trained outside Africa, but we came back. So I think we, we sometimes look at those who left but we don't pay attention to those who came back and what yes. brought them back. What incentives do we have? I understand, for instance, if you work in the universities, the facilities are not available, the facilitation by the institution is not available, but we have people doing work in Africa. So I think the way we need to ask uh, this question, we may want to invest it. We have brain drain, of course, but there are people who came back. There are people in the region. How do we incentivize them to stay in the region? What motivation do we put in the systems to ensure that they stay within the system? Mm -hmm. So we need to acknowledge that. And as much as Joseph went, Caleb is still in Uganda. What has kept him in Uganda? Yes. That's a question we should be asking. Thank you. Pontiana, what has kept you in Uganda? Why are you still there? <laughs> we are pleased. We are delighted to see you there. We are delighted to see you in Kigali. But please share. Yeah, but I think researchers are not in isolation. Brain drain will continue if there are no, no infrastructure, poor funding, salaries, the environment is bad. That pushes people away. I think we need to address all these issues. Yeah, and we cannot really impose. I've faced this, I've trained many people. I keep training, some go, others stay. I can't keep them around, but we just have to provide the right environment. And the other one is also to produce scientists that are relevant. Sometimes when we hear of new courses or new technology, we start producing hundreds. Now bioinformatics is the word of the day. Every university is producing bioinformatician. But you ask, where are they going to be absorbed? But it is sexy. We have bioinformatician. So we have to be careful. How many, what are we producing? Are we able to absorb them? So there are all these issues in our planning. Sometimes we are poor planning planners. We produce many virologists. We don't know what they are going to do. So we have to be a little bit careful. But this is part of the whole, what is happening in Africa, the environment, the funding, and all that. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Joseph threw out a question there, which I will let land at the desks of uh, the ministers of health or even the regional director of the World Health Organization. Um, he suggested that countries could not absorb the amount of talent that is being produced by the universities and research institutes. Hence, sometimes they're better off going away to sharpen and develop their skills before maybe coming back later, as he plans to do, don't you, Joseph? Um, are there any representatives, ministers of health, who want to address that a particular uh, challenge that he put out there. I'm just looking, don't all rush forward at once at the front row to, give the, to describe the picture in Rwanda, for example, or any other country, Mozambique, Liberia, Ethiopia, Comoros, Gabon, because these things cannot be done without partnership with government, with Malawi, Tanzania. Togo, please, yes. Merci. Alors, j'ai écouté les collègues. Ah, could, I, could I pause you for one second? Because not everybody speaks French, I think, on the panel. Could we have yeah. some headsets before you to make sure that they can understand you? Il faut qu'ils comprennent. 
Could we have um, the headset, please? Yes. Deux instants, s'il vous plaît, messieurs. Il faut que je prenne aussi parce que mon français n'est pas aussi bien qu'avant. Donc il faut que je j'écoute, interprète. Et bon, monsieur, c'est à vous. Merci. Donc je disais que j'ai écouté les collègues dans leurs interventions. C'est vrai que la plupart de nous qui sommes ici en Afrique, nous avons été formés en Occident. C'est vrai que le plus souvent, nos frères qui sont restés ont évoqué ou évoquent le manque d'infrastructures pour la mise en œuvre qu'ils ont appris et pour leur évolution. En fait, se pose ainsi une sorte de conflit entre ce qu'on peut appeler le projet individuel et le projet collectif. Parce que quand on prend les ressources, quelles qu'elles soient, les plus importantes sont les ressources humaines. Vous prenez quelqu'un qui a appris la chirurgie cardiaque à Paris. Ben, avant lui, il ne peut pas avoir de chirurgie cardiaque à Lomé, puisqu'il n'y en avait pas avant. Mais il faut qu'il soit là pour qu'il oriente, que sa présence conduise les gouvernants et qu'il explique la nécessité de la chose. C'est-à-dire, il faut qu'on accepte un travail de débroussaillage et de sacrifice pour contribuer à la constitution de la masse critique. Parce que si à chaque fois, on se dit, ben, de toutes les façons, il n'y a pas ceci, il n'y a pas, on conjugue la forme négative des verbes, on ne pourra pas constituer la masse critique. Et donc, c'est ce qui fait que moi, je suis partisan que nos frères ne voient pas uniquement leur projet purement individuel et qu'ils nous aident en rentrant à faire le premier travail de déboursaillage que les Occidentaux ont fait à travers les tout premiers qui ont fait les découvertes. Je vous remercie. Ok, merci messieurs. Thank you very much indeed for that. Before you respond. <laughs> Joseph shook his head wildly. He doesn't want to respond. Um, I think, Honorable Minister from Uganda, you wanted to contribute, did you? You're smiling at me, meaning, I think, yes. Ça veut dire oui? Yes. I did not want, but you, 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 you chose me. But this is a very interesting subject. And I must really say that, true, not many countries have actually invested in research and yet it is very important we have a lot of potential on the african continent but due to lack of funding as said by the previous speakers much of, most of these this talent is lost and of course the researchers that remain sometimes in the country do research for others and this goes back to what my sister from kenya was saying that whose research are you actually doing? So the researchers that remain in countries are actually doing research for the other people who are interested in getting results out of whatever they want to um, achieve. But in my country, of course, we do value research. And of course, we've had challenges with funding. But I must say there is political will to support this initiative. We have the Uganda Industrial Research Institute. We have the Uganda Virus Research Institute. And all this is evidence that in Uganda we do value research. And there is also in country a presidential uh, fund which supports research. So, and of course we now have a fully fledged Ministry of Science and Technology which is supposed to work closely with these um, research institutes to promote research in the country. 
Honourable thank Minister, you. thank you very much. Let's, before we come back to you, come to the Honourable Minister from Liberia. What is the position in Liberia, in Monrovia? Whether the issue of brain drain is a discussion we should be having, like the way we can have it in every forum. And that is because um, this morning we emphasized the community health workforce, so a good bit of our diseases can be prevented. Nevertheless, they have to refer to the next level. Now, if we invest, often we don't invest also in the training, the, the health workforce, the specialized ones, the professionals, the way we should. That's the first thing. The second thing is we are training people that we cannot absorb. We don't have the market for them. And so a good bit of them end up leaving. If we invest in expanding the training and train more and consider the fact that a good bit of your preventive things will be taken care of at the community level. Even if people leave, you will still have people to work. So that's the first thing. The other thing is the tax shifting. We've discussed this from forum to forum. In Liberia, we introduced the obstetric surgical emergency training for midwives. And it was lessons learned from Mozambique surgical technicians training. So there, the young doctors are complaining. Why are we training midwives, giving the midwives the same training we are giving them? That is to tell you that the results are similar. It is not different. They are getting the same results. So we, not, we, we talk about the tax shifting, but we don't, we don't use it as we should. So we continue to train people who will leave. If you shift some of these tax to the lower level, you will train them and they will end up staying. In fact, those are the people who will go in the most difficult areas for you, in fact, as compared to the professionals, the high level cadres of workers also. So we don't do that. And I believe if we expand the training, invest in the health infrastructure, expand the training. Another model that the West use is how you finance the training. Most of our training, for instance, is either free on the government or is highly subsidized by the government. In the West, they have financing models that you're responsible for the training yourself. And it is supported one way or the other. So if you decide to leave, it's not a loss for the government. Thank you. Honorable Minister, thank you very much for that. So we heard from Liberia, Togo, and Uganda, and some encouraging words, um, a willingness to engage, to take some of the criticisms on the chin but Pontiano, I'm just wondering um, what the position really is in Uganda, because, of course, your minister um, is being encouraging, and that's a fantastic. It's excellent. But what are the bottlenecks, then, for you as a um, research scientist who has worked all over the world, is now back home? Where, where are the bottlenecks? <clears throat> I think, as the Honourable Minister mentioned, I think Uganda has really moved ahead of... Uh, a number of African countries. At least some of the ingredients do exist. The plan is there. We have uh, set up the Uganda National Health uh, Research Organization. The political will is there and all that. But I think what is missing, I think our budgets are small. Yeah? There are many other priorities. Yeah? So there, there is good will, but we need that to be followed by the check. The check. So the check is very small. We understand, of course, there are other priorities, but the check is still uh, small. But we're building on that. From my experience, I've seen the goodwill. I've been an advocate. Go, uh, uh, I've been able to reach everywhere, including Minister of Finance, Minister of Health, and I can see the goodwill. The more, when you talk and you show evidence, there's a response. Last, the last time I was uh, the Minister of Finance, they were asking me, but what do you do? You want money, but what do you do? When you start talking about things they know, Ebola, you know Ebola? Oh, you know Zika? You say, oh, we need to translate the things that will, will, will stimulate. The other thing, question that I've been, uh, response I've been getting, but you researchers, you get a lot of money from abroad. Why do you need our money? Yeah. You say, yeah, this money we get does this and that and that, but these are the gaps. So it is continuous, uh, really educating advocacy and explaining that has to go. But I think the will is there, 
we just need to, to cut the check so that at least the words are followed by action. But I think it's a good starting point. Thank you very much indeed. Well, the check is language everybody understands. I'm just wondering how one can generate more of the kind of money that will maintain your independence, Mary, to do the kind of research that you want without the pressure you get from external donors to research according to their diktat. What kind of new uh, and innovative research funding models are you able to work with in, uh, in Kenya? Um, one of the key challenges um, in Kenya, for instance, is the government really doesn't put money in research. And if you have a strategy, for instance, we now have an NCD strategy for the country. We have major gaps. We are currently also looking at SDGs with 169 targets. We have major gaps. If, as a country, we cannot put domestic funding for such research, it means those gaps will never be understood. We are expected to report every so often. Where are we getting the data to do this reporting? And therefore, my key challenge to our government is we sign all the declaration. Uh, profs talked about all these things about allocating resources for research. We really do need to implement some of these commitments because domestic funding allows the country to then conduct research that's relevant for the country needs. Secondly, if our development partners uh, come into the country and you have your strategies right and you are focused on those strategies, could we ask them to help us respond to questions on the strategy? I know several of them are doing that. Thirdly is to use existing data and information in the country. All NGOs, for instance, produce a lot of data. That data is hidden in reports to donors, is not published, but is relevant to solving our problems within the region. And sometimes we ignore that component of research. Is the data not released because nobody asks the NGOs for it, or is it because the NGOs see it as their property and there is value in it and that's why they sit on it for themselves? It's a combination of that. One, they are not required to publish it. It's for programmatic uh, uh, importance. It's for programmatic use. Secondly, the uh, we may not be asking them to release the data, but all I'm saying is that all the NGOs represented here, all the donors here, have reports with very rich data that sometimes is not available for decision making and policy making. So we can use available data to inform some of the strategies we are trying to look at. There, is, there are resources in that sector that we are not using, but I think as WHO, it's important for us to begin to ask our countries how much are we investing in research, and in many countries, it's not much. Thank All right, we're going to go to West Africa now. Honourable Minister from Sierra Leone is going to make a, a brief intervention to add to the wealth of discussion that we're having in this session. So let's hope that your local microphone works. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonsu. I hope I pronounced it right. Mr. Bonsu. Bonsu. But you are from Sierra Leone. You can say Bonsu. It's fine. I actually am going back a little bit. And I hope and pray that somebody from the panel can answer my question. Let's go back to Sierra Leone or the Mano River Union Axis. How do you conduct the research? Who is involved? Do we go to the community level? My question about this is that when different organizations go to my country and start talking about research, people run away from them. That's a fact. So if we are not engaging the people who need to be engaged for the research to be successful, what are we talking about? Thank you very much. A very, very pertinent question. Who would like to take that one? Um, Joseph first I think that's, a, that's really a fair point and you know at least the way that I was uh, mentored and trained you know research starts with a good question and the question comes from a research problem or a problem that you're facing uh, maybe at a clinic or in your community and uh, 
a lot, because of the way resources are generated for research, the problems are not organic problem. Uh, the, the research problems are not organic problems. So we are answering problems that come from elsewhere, and that's why I was advocating uh, an emphasis on the context of where research is performed. So if a clinic in a district has a, a problem, for example, there's a lot of waiting time in a clinic, then a time and motion survey can solve that problem. But it has to be at the community level. So the prob we have to find a way of identifying problems, turning them into research questions, and like you said, engaging uh, the people who are involved or who are facing that problem, and then moving on to research. The perception that research is done by PhDs and people with epidemiology degrees, I think is one of the problems, but uh, to me, research is done by anyone who is willing to count and who is willing to think critically about a problem. And if you go to clinics all around the continent, there's a lot of talent, a lot of smart people who are even well-trained. Uh, like the Minister of Health from Liberia say, talking about uh, uh, task shifting, you can actually task shift uh, a, a big proportion of, uh, of research questions. All right. Uh, anybody else want to take that one? Uh, Michael, you want to? Any, I mean, Joseph was saying somebody who is willing to count and to do the work. So imagine if you're going down to, to, to Freetown, how would you engage honorable ministers, local people uh, on the Mano River who may say, who are you? Why are you coming here? What do you want to do to us? Well, um, just to uh, come back, I do represent a public-public partnership which is involving um, governments at the decision-making body. When I talked about 14 African countries and 14 European countries, here we have ministries of health represented at our General Assembly, and these are the ones that endorse the policy. How we do business they determine uh, how we proceed. And when it comes to funding, it is a consultative approach. We involve the different stakeholders. And just to mention an area, for example, we advise that we should focus on majorly on unmet medical needs. For example, many of the interventions are involving children, um, very young infants, maternal health, adolescents, and some of the populations that are marginalized, where often these are excluded from studies, and you find there are medications out there, there are products out there that have not been properly evaluated in these populations. So the information that comes out is actually relevant to the countries where this is applied. Who conducts the work? The work is conducted by the countries. They are the partners. This is just giving an example. Very good. Um, we have Kenya. Minister from Kenya, please make an intervention there. Uh, thank you so much, Brana Bonsu. Um, I think I just want to clarify a point made by the speaker from Kenya. Um, in terms of commitment by government in research, I think our government is very committed and it has a national research agenda and plan which is in place which f uh, guides what we do. In terms of also resources, and I think it's a common phenomenon in all African countries that, yes, we are committed, but at times the resourcing is not adequate. But as a government, what we've done is we have committed uh, a certain proportion of our um, revenue every year that goes into research. We have institutions that have been set up, uh, specialized in nature, like one for medical research, we have one for forestry, we have one for agriculture, we have one for uh, policy, we have one also for livestock. So we have institutions that are, <clears throat> that are in place and um, annually, like uh, what we got is National Health Research Fund, which every year we put in 25 million US dollars to be able to fund some of the things. And... But Minister, could I ask you, how do you identify... Um, and support and monitor the research projects that you think are crucial. You know, you've got $25 million that year. How do you decide in Kenya who to give that money to, who is doing the innovative work that is really crucial? Um, in terms of uh, research, 
we have an institution called NACOST, the National uh, um, Commission of Research and Technology, Science and Technology, which everyone uh, submits their proposals to. And then based on the national agenda, it is prioritized and funded by government. And then also the priorities that come from the other institutions like KEMRI, for example, Kenya Medical Research Institute. They develop an agenda, submit to our ministry, that is our, my, our ministry, and then we support that proposal to the Treasury for allocation of resources. And then in addition, we also now approach development partners to help us in the area of um, either uh, equipping the laboratories and also funding some of the uh, researchers. But most of the time, we try to fund our own uh, research, researchers. Thank you. Honorable Minister, thank you very much. And Pontiano. I just wanted to uh, be a little bit provocative here. We have WHO here. We are talking about governments and all that. I want to turn my guns to WHO. Y your guns? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is WHO doing enough? Yeah. WHO, many countries listen to WHO, and they are very good advocates. But how much advocating for research are they doing? Yeah. Me as a researcher, there are times when I feel WHO is missing. Yeah? Is missing. I deal, you see NIH, you see CDC, you see other, well, they come around with a, when there are emergencies, rushing and all that. But are they real good advocates? Yeah? I think to me this is another missing gap that we need to fill. Uh, do they, in the countries, where are they? So, maybe I'm ignorant, but I want to be a little to, be, to hear more about WHO and what steps they have, and do they have research in their documents? Do they talk about it? I want to be a little bit provocative here. Okay, thank you very much for being the agent provocateur. Before we hear a, a, a response, or maybe not, to that question, um, Mary one, wants to intervene. Yeah, just to thank um, my Kenyan uh, colleague that I work for Kemri and I know we do research. But the question is, how much does re that research involve policy? And I think that's the gap we are trying to address in terms of what's the link between what these institutions do and policy making. How are we using these institutions that we provide some limited funding to, to inform the SDG agenda or the UHC agenda. And there lies, therein lies the gap between policy making and research in most of our countries. And also the fact that we give a certain amount of money, which is not enough to conduct robust research. We'll agree our universities really don't have money for research because the funding is not there. But the, the link between policy and research is something that I would really like a comment on as WHO uh, responds to this other question. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. So, yeah, a number of um, guns, as you said, uh, that have been targeted. And I'm just wondering if Dr. Mweti the WHO Regional Director for Africa would like to take that first gun from our colleague there. Just because of the violent language used by this uh, panelist, I'd like to turn it over to another male to respond to his question. So I'm asking, uh, I'm asking Della Dovlo, our Director of Health, Health Systems, who leads our work on research to answer to your question. Thank you. Della, please. Ah, there he is, the guilty man. No, I'm joking. <clears throat> I'm a rather soft-hearted man, and uh, 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 with an aversion to guns. Um, there are a number of areas by which we try to support research. One is we've worked with governments to help develop national health research strategies, to create the policies, and then as part of that to help create the ethics and regulatory councils. I agree that we have not covered the entire region adequately. And often after these are developed, the implementation is a problem because of the investment that is required to do that. We have other smaller sort of uh, interventions. We've created a regional strategy that we are trying to implement to spread the uptake of research a lot more. Part of this is what was referred to as the Afrobarometer, which is where we intend to show 
how well countries are doing in various aspects of research development as a way of advocating and encouraging countries to pick things up. Finally, we do have a young researchers program. It's small started where we, can, we provide uh, small seed money to young researchers with good proposals to begin to build that capacity to take forward. And we have about 25 WHO collaborating centers within the Africa region that also help us to support uh, the work of research. Thank you. Dr. Dovlo, thank you very much indeed, and you're nodding, uh, Pontiano, so that, that, that's a good thing. But, I mean, we haven't addressed that point that Mary made about research being done but not being joined up with policy. So what's informing policy? Uh, I'm going to turn to the minister from Gabon. Not, you don't have to answer that question about whether there is joined up thinking between policy you know, and the research in your country. But if you want to answer that question when you make your own point, I'll be delighted. Please, s'il vous plaît, monsieur. Merci. En tout cas, officiellement, vous venez de me nommer ministre de la Santé. Mais je ne suis que le représentant du ministre de la Santé. Peut-être que ça ne tardera pas, quoi qu'il en soit. Alors, en fait, c'était là un peu le but de mon intervention. Parce que, au niveau, moi, je, je regarde un peu la sous-région d'Afrique centrale et je me rends compte que dans le, il, il n'y a pas de politique nationale de recherche ni de recherche pour la santé. C'est-à-dire que la recherche est faite de façon disparate par différents centres de recherche en fonction de leur intuition personnelle ou des problématiques qu'ils ont observées. Mais la demande ne vient pas du ministère de la Santé lui-même qui aurait, par exemple, un schéma directeur par rapport, à, on va dire, à, à, à des problèmes prioritaires. Parce que la recherche doit quand même répondre aux questions du système de santé. Il faut que la recherche soit d'abord opérationnelle. Je veux dire que c'est vrai qu'il y a eu une grande épidémie d'Ebola et puis on a vu arriver une, une, une centaine d'équipes de, de recherche en Afrique de l'Ouest de façon très ponctuelle. Et puis on pense que lorsque le phénomène va s'estomper dans les prochaines années, la problématique de recherche ne sera plus vraiment là. Alors ce qu'il faut, c'est que les pays développent d'abord des politiques nationales de recherche qu'il puisse avoir des schémas directeurs, des orientations, une sorte de puzzle que lorsqu'il y a des organes ou des, 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 des organismes de recherche qui viennent, on peut insérer telle partie, telle partie dont on attend un résultat. Ce qu'il y a aussi, c'est qu'il n'y a aucune évaluation de l'ensemble de ces recherches évaluées, euh, effectuées par tous ces centres de recherche. Au niveau du Gabon, on est vraiment au stade embryonnaire parce que cette réflexion a été faite puisque nous disposons de deux grands centres de recherche internationaux reconnus afin qu'on puisse les, euh, les réunir et pouvoir les, orienter les domaines de recherche de ces centres dans les attentes du, du gouvernement en matière de recherche. Et puis il y a toujours ce problème de financement de la recherche. Donc le Gabon est en train de s'orienter vers une agence nationale de la recherche qui permettrait qu'il y ait un fonds de la recherche avec des appels d'offres de façon, je veux dire, adéquate à la demande du secteur santé. Il y a aussi un grand problème et cette sectorisation fait, la sectorisation dont j'ai parlé montre, fait en sorte que des partenariats sous-régionaux ne sont pas développés entre le Gabon, le Cameroun, le Congo, la RDC, qui partagent la même aire géographique, je veux dire, de la, du, des forêts tropicales humides d'Afrique centrale. Il n'y a pas une coordination sous-régionale de la recherche. Donc, ce serait bien que les, 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 les pays aussi s'unissent pour développer des partenariats sous-régionaux. Et puis, bénéficiant justement des, des, des appuis euh, des... des des, des organismes de recherche euh, du Nord, eh bien, plus que la demande vient quand même du Sud, ce serait bien de développer des partenariats Nord-Sud dans lesquels on est gagnant-gagnant. Euh, voilà, c'est un peu la, vers ça que s'oriente vraiment le Gabon et on espère qu'avec l'appui des partenaires, on puisse vraiment faire aboutir cela dans les meilleurs délais parce qu'on a vraiment euh, des, des thématiques Absolument. de recherche et surtout yeah. des, 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 des centres de recherche qui sont vraiment très bien outillés. Merci. Better partnership and uh, collaboration is crucial. We're going to have an, an, a final brief intervention in this part before we hear from some of our colleagues. People have got their hands up. Uh, from Tanzania, please. Well, thank you very much, Monso. 
I think the question that we've been addressing this session is one on innovation and data for sustainable development. Because health, health research has always been there and uh, we're not going to declare it obsolete in any time soon. We have uh, many diseases that we have to confront in the societies that we live. And as Joseph said, there are certain researches that are standard because uh, the application cuts across the board. But we cannot leave this place thinking that one solution can fit all problems. Even in our countries, there are problems that are reported country-wise, but solutions must be contextualized to the place where uh, people live. Topography, infrastructure, human resource for health, uh, commodities of health and the availability, all those can contribute to that problem. Now, whether National Institutes for Research can influence policy, the answer is on the affirmative yes. In Tanzania, the National Institute of Medical Research helped us a lot decide when to abandon chloroquine. That was a major shift on policy. The National Institute of Medical Research did a TB survey in the country, and that was very good. So sometimes we, as a ministry, instruct them on what to do. Other times, out of their own innovation, they decide what needs to be done. But the audience will be happy to note that the Fakara Health, Health, Health Institute has contributed a lot to the world. A majority of us are aware of the surgical checklist. That was done in collaboration with many other centers. So again, our scientists should not just think of doing researches individually. They can do them in collaboration with other centers and contextualize the, re the research results uh, locally. And we can employ their results in the environment where they were done. And the global health security agenda is one such uh, intervention that makes us to be one people around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, this oh my word. I can see about 10 hands up, and we've got about 10, 12 minutes left. So the only way we're going to get you all in and get a, a closing comment from our colleagues is if I'm lean and mean with you. I know I've left you waiting for a long time, but you're going to have to be really, really brief. I'm going to give you no more than 30 seconds each person. So let me go to... Oh, gentleman right in the middle there, he's holding up a, a booklet or something, a white booklet. You have to be very brief, otherwise I'll have to cut you off. Uh, Sorry about that, but yes, go on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yoswa uh, Dambisia from the East Central Southern Africa Health Community. And I'm happy to be speaking immediately after the United Republic of Tanzania. Because the frustration that uh, is expressed by the researchers is often expressed by our ministers as well that researchers do the work and they don't know what the work is about. And to that end, they set in place a mechanism through a best practices forum where the researchers come to showcase their work, make recommendations that lead up to the ministerial discussions and resolutions are made. So there are definite mechanisms within the Exa Health community for picking up this. But we realize that that is not enough. So increasingly, we are taking on aspects of implementation research, and Michael will be aware of some of the initiatives that they are supporting us okay. uh, to do uh, in this. So that from the outset... That's a very good example. I'm going to have to let you land there, otherwise the others won't get through, but that's a really useful contribution. My word, who next? Lady there. Thank you. My name is Margaret Kirimbu, an intern doctor from Tanzania. Uh, the road to universal health coverage. I think most of us, when uh, we read that, we think of modern health. But do we think of a uh, majority of Africans who prefer traditional health? Do we think this is going to be an obstacle uh, in attaining that goal? So as we go down that road and are researching how we are going to achieve it, I think we also should research on uh, some of the obstacles, including a lot of our citizens, as I've experienced, preferring to go to the traditional okay. medicine first before coming to the modern health that we are advertising right now. Very good. Thank you. Gentleman in the pink shirt there, right there. Yep. Thank you very much. My name is Vincent Gassana. I'm a journalist. Really interesting issues, especially for somebody from outside the area. 
One thing occurs to me, it seems to me that um, most of the questions can actually be answered by a greater coordination between policy and research. We are in Chigali and uh, we're coming towards the end of what here is called um, Kwibuka 23, that's the remembrance of the um, million or so who died in a genocide. And that included um, a lot of health professionals. Years ago, this country effectively ceased to exist. Now, um, the healthcare in this country um, is as good as anywhere in Africa and actually beyond others. My question here is that if with um, the limited human resources, because a lot of people who died were healthcare for professionals, uh, if Rwanda can do where it has got to now, how is it that countries that have got more resources, bigger countries, have not had the problems this country has had, why is it that we're going through all of this? Very good question. Thank you very much. We'll leave it hanging there. Gentlemen, right, there's two of you right together. Gentleman in blue shirt and the glasses and then gentleman in this stripy shirt as well. Is it? Thank you very much. My name is Kurt Figueroa. Uh, my question will be directed into education. Like if many of the researchers that work in, uh, in African countries have gone abroad and have made their, uh, their MPHs or PhDs or doctor PhDs abroad, then it means that in these countries there is some kind of problem into education. So what are they going to do? Like if, if I'm a minister of health and I went to study abroad and then I return to my country and then I know that there is an MPH program in my university over there but I'm not doing nothing or something towards rising that problem up so I can attract more people into my programs instead of, of leaving them to go to another countries, then this is a big problem. Um, that's it. All right, thank you. Gentlemen, right behind you. And we'll go over here now in a minute. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gasana Joel, a University of Rwanda student. Uh, I have a, a concern, especially on research done by university students. Um, uh, research, we have research every year for almost every university student here in Rwanda and uh, in Africa, but the, but the problem is what does the factors do you think are influencing research utilization? Uh, whether the government are not trusting our results, they mean that it means that they don't trust our education, yeah. whether we don't uh, explain when <laughs> The, the result. What are the factors do you think are really influencing it? Thank right. you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there was a hand over there. Oh, there. One, two, three, four. Gentleman going wild at the back with the blue book in his hand. Thank you so much. My name is Kostika. Uh, I have another view where we can address the problem for research. I had a student and ministers and others one question is, even WHO and other institutions does research, where did they get money? So the answer is, most of researches are funded by pharmaceutical industries or companies. So my question is, can we find a finance way we establish three or four research centers for example, if the Minister of Health of Tanzania and Uganda, you are buying malaria drugs for 200 million US dollars. If you ask a company you buy drugs to establish a research center in a joint with the government, it will work. They will invest money for researches. That's why even those students, say they do research, but research without productive or production is nothing. So as the, the person who presented, our governments, institutions, they need to have an idea for business. You are talking about research, uh, Professor said the incentive is low because you do research but you don't produce. I do research, I still import 100% of medical drugs. It makes no sense because... Right. Thank you very much for your point. One more question, and it's, it's been may, may, too much men. I need to do a bit of balance here. Lady over there. Honourable Minister, you are the Queen here. I cannot go to you. <laughs> Lady there in the series, yes. Much. Um, I'm Janine Chondo. I'm uh, also a researcher, but now I'm uh, working as implementer at the Ministry of Health. I'm the Director General of Rwanda Medical Center. So I have quick questions. Now, you know, being from the academic, it's totally different from being an implementer. My question goes to 
all the panelists on how our set agenda can be considered as a priority for those who have money. I can have my research agenda, which is great. We do have our research agenda. But how can you make sure that not only by the government, which is easy, we always have RD, part of the budget, but how can, can it go beyond the government and put our priorities together? The second question is the, the my question goes to EDCTP uh, president. We know that we used to do north, south, south, south collaboration, but how can we ensure that the know-how stays within the country. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for that. So, Michael, do you want to take that last point, just mop it up quickly, and then any of the others that you think you can handle? Because people were bouncing around all over the place, wanting greater collaboration between governments and uh, drugs companies, research with a real end product, problem with education, greater coordination. If Rwanda can do it, given what happened in 1994, why can't some of the others do it? Traditional health workers, uh, best practice, practices in the East Central Sahel, so much. So, but first of all, that point the lady was making there. Thank you. If I may start with the last question, uh, which was specifically addressed to EDSTP. How do we ensure that the know-how remains in the countries. Just to let you know, um, we do support collaborative research, but we, also, we are also very intentional in raising or developing local capacity. Uh, between 2003 and 2015, we individually funded more than 600 postdoctoral African researchers and more than 95% of these are working in Africa. Within the second program, which started in 2004, rather 2014, we've targeted to have more than 400. And we have uh, five fellowship schemes that are targeted for Africans to develop both in excellence and scientific leadership. So there isn't even need for transfer here. It is local capacity being developed. In the collaborative projects, um, one of the things that we also emphasize is local leadership. More than 70% of the principal investigators are Africans as well. Okay, Michael, I'm going to have to end you there. Thanks. And Mary, on to you. You heard some of the issues that were being raised. Can you mop them up all in 45 seconds? Um, one is just to emphasize on the need for coordination at the country level. Uh, the last uh, presenter asked how do we ensure that our agenda is what is funded. Here we need the governments to help us with ensuring that whatever we've put in our health policies, in our national strategies, is what influences how we are supported by external donors. And as they come into the country, if we can put that at the forefront of the support we need from, from them, it may help us address our own agendas in the country. Again, synthesize, analyze existing data, because in our countries we have a lot of data that goes unanalyzed, and yet we can use it for policy making. Thank you. Excellent. On to you, uh, Joseph. I would like to, to challenge the uh, stakeholders in the room, the ministers, uh, the people who hold uh, power. If you have a problem and you identify it clearly, and you come to a researcher and say, here's the problem, uh, what do you think is the solution? And you come with a bag of resources. I can assure you 100% of the time that, re that problem is going to be solved with the highest quality of data. So if you have a problem, put the money where your problem is, and uh, chances are you'll find a rigorous data-driven solution. Excellent. Pontiano, finally. Yeah, one point I wanted, a gentleman raised an important point, which I wanted also to talk about, is that sometimes we doing research in Africa, we forget about research and production. We forget about IP issues. We forget about royalties. When somebody is reading, reading a proposal from collaborators or in the institution, you read about the science, the budget. When it reaches intellectual property, you skip. You skip the pages. Either you don't understand it or the institutions don't have enough capacity to interpret for you. And we have lost out. We have lost out a lot. We send specimen to abroad and we forget about IP issues, royalties. And I think that is not putting people first. 
Then the issue of uh, university research and all that, so that it's important. Again, it has to fit into research priorities, if it is be effective, and filling the gaps, research gaps. Very important. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for staying with us throughout the duration till, what, two minutes past six? We're going to have to end it there. So please join me in thanking your panel, Dr. Michael Makanga. Dr. Mary Amyunza, keep it going. Niamongo. Mr. Joseph B. Abigbura. And Professor Pontiano Kalebu. Your panel, thank you very much indeed. That was Health Research, Innovating and Data for Sustainable Development. I hope it pressed some of the points you wanted. If not, very sorry about that. But this is a debate that will continue. Now back to our MC. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I will have a, a few announcements. First of all, of course, to thank our panelists and our moderator. A few announcements before we move to our next session, our next side event. This side event is called Engaging Africa's Youth to Achieve Universal Health Coverage, and it is taking place in this auditorium at, and immediately after I finish these announcements. Uh, please also be reminded that at 7 p.m., you are cordially invited to a cocktail hosted by the government of Rwanda on the terrace of the Kigali Convention Center. The ushers will be available to guide you. Also be informed that shuttles will be made available to transport you back to your hotels after the cocktail, as well as tomorrow morning. Now for tomorrow's morning session, it's going to start at 9 a.m. here in the auditorium. Uh, at, at, at 8 a.m., we will have a closed session on e-health in room AD10. The participants for this closed session have already received an invitation. For lost and found items, please contact the front desk at the entrance of the convention center. And I've also been asked to remind you to kindly bring your badges for tomorrow morning. Please bring your badges when you come to the meeting. Uh, let me thank our, our panelists. Thank you very much. And now we are going to just quickly make a switch as we are going to invite um, our next uh, uh, panelist for the side event on engaging Africa's youth. And as we do that, okay, they want to have a, a, a photograph. So whilst they have their photograph, for the rest of everybody in this room, please stay where you are. Um, what we are going to do is we are going to have a little bit of a stretch um, and uh, I'm going to ask that they put some music on whilst we go into the youth side session. Let us uh, get our youthful side and I would like to invite uh, Dr. Zawaira um, 